All right, Dana, so you have uh, talked to us a little bit about some of the changes, both professionally and personally, that you had to make. We're going to get into the how in just a moment, because I'm imagining that's uh, what most of the folks here want to know, is how you did that, you know, whether that's a mindset or what the process was of that. But are there any other changes that perhaps we wouldn't be thinking of um, or other things that you've had to adapt to now that you know, we're five, six months into uh, the pandemic, whether that's professionally or personally? I think professionally, I think the biggest thing is really um, keeping an eye out for my, for my colleagues, you know, for my staff. Um, we need those people to be able to come to work. I mean, it's crucial. I cannot run my office and see patients without help. I need my front office, I need my back office. And so if um, my staff is not able to be safe, then really it makes it almost impossible for me to see patients, which, you know, that could take out, you know, just for our small office. If you think about larger offices where there's multiple docs, we have two docs and two nurse practitioners that could take out easily, you know, 60 to 70 patients a day that we're unable to see. So that's why I think it's just crucial um, for people to do something so simple as wear a mask when you're out in public, you know, not do large gatherings. So COVID really has, you know, changed, um, changed just the way we do just about everything. I mean, you know, there were times I would get out of my car and start heading into the hospital. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I forgot my mask and have to go back to the car. And for me, it's also thinking a little bit further down the road. It's not just a mask. You know, I have to have an N95 with me at all times, too, because of the possibility of, you know, a potential, you know, patient under investigation or a COVID patient. Um, most of the patients we're encountering now are presenting asymptomatically. So, you know, that's now another level. Before, it seemed like patients had symptoms. So you could kind of identify, oh, this patient has chest pain or shortness of breath or a fever. But now we're seeing more and more patients who are asymptomatic, which, you know, I think we let our laurels down and we tend to get a little careless um, with how to protect ourselves. Um, so those are the things. It's, it's just a really big paradigm shift in thinking about protection. I do think somewhat it's good because um, doctors, healthcare professionals tend to get a little bit lazy when we are doing um, deliveries, um, specifically not so much when we're in the operating room, but we tend to get a little lazy. We may not you know, always have our eye protection on. We run in to do a delivery. So now we're definitely um, watching out for each other. And if I forget to get my face shield, the nurse will run and get it for me. So we really kind of bonded a lot better. For me personally, um, this has been a little bit of a challenge too, because my mother has dementia and she um, is in a memory care uh, uh, facility. And I'm used to seeing my mom pretty much almost daily, if not every other day, and talking to her, you know, three to four times a day to just check on her, what her needs are, and being dependent on other people to meet her needs and to care for her um, has really been probably the hardest part of all of this. Not even so much my job, but just the care of my mom. Yeah, absolutely. That's key, that, that caring for other folks. I mean, obviously we have to care for ourselves, but how do we care for others, whether they're our loved ones or people that uh, we work with or that we supervise? This didn't make it into the sermon this morning, uh, but part of the adapting to change, I joked with our staff uh, on Tuesday was, you know, we went through collectively as a staff, not all together at the same time, but went through um, the grieving process where there were definitely folks that on our staff like, nope, we'll be back April, we're good to go, Easter, here we go, um, or bargaining or anger even. And so, um, and, and then that idea of like, okay, we're five or six months into it, it is easy even from our side to, you know, kind of take for granted, this is our new normal, this is what we're doing, but and, and to get a little lax. And so trying to figure out how to make sure that we continue to care for ourselves and to definitely care for our loved ones. So let's let's try to tackle the how question, which I think is hard, right? It's easy at one level to tell us 
um, and to talk about what has changed, but how do we actually, how have you been able uh, to adapt to these changes? How can you look back? Are there any um, tools or resources that you would give us, whether that's our mindset or our faith or just the practicality? How have you been able uh, to do that yourself? I think for me, I mean, faith is always, you know, forefront and center. Um, I heavily rely on um, God's word and, you know, trying to make sure that I'm walking in a way that I'm being accountable to God. And by that, I mean, you know, if I am um, not wearing my mask, who am I actually putting at risk? you know, and do I really want to be in that position? Am I putting my child at risk or another patient? Um, so it's really kind of taking it down just to that level of accountability. The other thing is, you know, I have to spend time in prayer and with a busy schedule. Sometimes my schedule just seems really out of control. Um, I, I tend to come home and I have to kind of wind down, think about the day, consciously kind of let things go. And so what I did at the beginning of the quarantine, which was, this is gonna sound so ridiculous. Um, I have a really great bathtub that I probably have taken five baths in over the last 10 years. And so my daughters were really nice and they said, mom, you're working a lot. You really just need to take a bath. They cleaned the tub, cleaned everything, put some candles. And since that first like two weeks, I've been able to take a bath every week. And it's only because there is absolutely nothing else to do. <laughs> so it's not like, oh, you know, we can go to the movies or we can do other things. So I think just the quieting of the everyday has actually led to some really positive things. And because of that, I have more time to read and focus and actually i think i have talked to my friends more now than i have in years just because everybody is kind of in the same boat so we've been able to fellowship we've been able to talk about our life experiences how we're dealing with things um you know where where do we want to be in the next six months in the next year and I think for me, the quieting and not being so busy um, with everything else except for work and home life has enabled me to kind of get a different perspective, but not lose sight of my goals. I mean, I'm, I think it's enabled me to focus a little bit more on what's important, which is actually being more still now. And so for everyone listening would be, you know, what is your equivalent of your bathtub in your life, right? What is that for you? Maybe that make that one of your takeaways from today. How about with the other staff you work with, the patients that you serve and care for? How have you um, been able to help them to adapt to change? Uh, I was joking with someone a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about this series. And I said, you know, there's always a danger as a pastor, especially in preaching, where it, the message just comes off as, adapt to change, right? Like just do it without actually giving resources or helping people along. And so how have you been able to, to do that with um, other staff or with people that you're serving your patients? Well, I will say we have had a market increase in use of our behavioral health um, teams. I think um, being at home for some patients, for some people in general is not great for them. It's been a good experience for me, um, but I don't think it's been as wonderful for other people, whether that means they're in, you know, an unstable relationship, um, whether home just isn't what they want it to be, or they feel um, like they don't have a way out, like their goals that they had been setting and working towards, whether it was school or work, some of those things have been on delay or in some cases kind of taken off the table. So we've utilized our behavioral health team a lot more, even in, in patients that I didn't think would ever need that kind of service. We've seen that. And I think just really encouraging um, people to get out, take a walk, 
Um, initially, we weren't seeing a lot of people out walking because I think everybody was kind of scared with the mask um, and the quarantine, especially in Denver County. But now, you know, I hear patients coming in, they're like, we took a bike ride. My family has never done, done that together, or we've taken a walk, or we've gone to the mountains and, you know, gone for a hike. I do think people are spending more quality time at home with their families. I just hope it's healthy time. Um, so that's what we've done, behavioral health, um, getting outside. Um, we've had an uncanny and wonderful springtime. I don't know if you guys remember, but I remember sitting outside in February and March, um, and the weather was absolutely beautiful, which seemed a little odd here in Colorado. Um, so I think those are kind of the big things. I do find too that we've seen um, patients are describing that they're actually cooking and they're actually eating better, which is amazing. You know, um, they're not going out to fast food restaurants as much. So, you know, um, my daughter who doesn't like to cook much at all, um, and tends to be on her phone quite a bit. I came home one day and she had looked up a recipe um, on how to make Portuguese pastries. And the whole kitchen was full of flour and dough and custard and she made these amazing pastries. And when I talked to my patients and some of my friends, they're like, my daughter's cooking or my son is cooking or, you know, they're learning how to write new stories. So I think encouraging um, people to find a new passion has been really um, wonderful. I like that, right? Finding a new passion or maybe even for some of us reconnecting with an old passion that you haven't been able to for whatever reason before. Yeah, what is that new passion? And some of these themes you're going to hear about in future weeks, right? Our physical health and our mental health. And so these are going to be themes you'll hear every week, I'm going to imagine, as we chat with our experts. So continue to be lifting those up. So Dana, in the in the sermon, I talked a, um, a little about, about grief and that we're all grieving at this time and in different places in the grieving process and talked about the idea of acceptance has that are, are you willing to to talk about or can you talk about uh if that's been part of your experience as you've been adapting uh to change whether that's professionally or personally i think the biggest thing that i've seen is i've had um i've had patients who have lost a family member during this time and i had one one patient who lost her uh, mother um, up in the Northeast in New York. And she was really battling with things because she wasn't able to bury her mother because the weather was so bad and the ground was cold and frozen and they would prepare a memorial and then they would have to call it off because of an outbreak in the town. And so this went on a couple of times and she finally was able to get her mom uh, memorialized and that was very challenging for her. Um, I think the grief is definitely different because you're not able to, you know, we're not able to grieve in the traditional way. And um, I think just encouraging patients to, and people in general, just to, um, do what they think is best for them. I'm a big believer that you know, part of our physical health and getting your annual exam, whether you're a man or a woman, should also include a mental health checkup. Um, that's not always the case. I think your mental health um, is equally, if not more important, because it, it guides you and leads you in how you care for yourself physically also. And our society is just so busy. Um, and you're told to come in, make sure you get your colonoscopy, get your shingles vaccine, get your, you know, influenza. Um, but people and healthcare providers have somewhat been um, at times reluctant to ask about mental health because sometimes it's opening up a can of worms and you may not be able to provide the resources or the amount of help that someone may need. But I also think that it's our job to at least um, inquire and ask and then go about trying to help find those resources. So grief has been very difficult for a lot of families during this time. Um, 
I do think it's interesting that technology has been developed to somewhat meet at this intersection because I can't imagine being quarantined and not being able to see someone or not being able to talk with someone or interact. And so we have been able to um, just make huge impacts in treating patients via Zoom or FaceTime, being able to call them and check on them whether they have diabetes or they've had a newborn and they have questions. So the level of technology has really elevated our game as healthcare providers in being able to care for patients. This, this has definitely um, opened up our space because now I think things will always be different. They will, they will have the potential to be better. We can go out into smaller communities and take care and see patients and tell them, yes, it's time for you to make that long drive and come in now. We need to see and take care of this. We can no longer do it you know, over the phone or via a video conference, um, which has not been available to patients in the past. So those things have really made a big impact, but the grief part is still a little bit in progress. And so it's good when, you know, and the other thing is, at least on Facebook, there's quite a few new um, coalitions and groups and committees that have been set up. And I think just that kind of gathering in small groups has really been helpful for a lot of people. So different perspectives, people maybe you wouldn't normally talk to or hear from because they're not in your age group or you know, politically affiliated with your belief system, we've opened that up and broadened that spectrum now. Yeah, absolutely. And I would imagine if folks wanted to reach out to you about any of those type of groups that they could email you or, yes. or find out and you'd be able to send them to some of those uh, places, right? Yes. Absolutely. Cool. Um, yeah, I think I, technology is the perfect example, I think, of how we've all <laughs> had to adapt, um, whether that's in healthcare or here in the church or just in our general lives. Um, we've joked many times and staff and in other meetings, like what, you know, what would the pandemic have been like just in 2015, just five years ago? You know, how has Zoom come along and our lives um, with technology are so different now that things would be even now are beginning to take for granted with technology um, because we've been doing this for so long that we just wouldn't have been able to do even just a couple of years ago for sure. So Dana, I didn't ask, uh, we're, I think I have one or two more questions and we'll open it up. I didn't, I didn't phrase, phrase it this way uh, on our prep doc, but thinking if, if Dana could look at her life uh, from a year ago, knowing now what you know and what you've learned, what would have surprised you? What have you learned about yourself, specifically when it comes to adapting to change or just if there's anything else in general? And the same thing, uh, have you learned anything new or surprising about God or your faith through all of this? If you would have looked a year ago and now that a year has happened, so last fall, last August, and now that's 2020, what, what have you learned about yourself through all of this? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I think, um, I think sometimes people in general, when they are not in a certain situation, they become disconnected from that situation. So case in point, if you're not going to church, you may not be interacting with your church community. You may not be um, um, fellowshipping with people in that way. I think what became really evident for me is I have built that community even outside of my church. And I think I had taken it for granted. You know, um, some of the ladies I work with at my job, um, one of my very best friends who works with me, we've been together for 20 years. I told her we're married at the job. Um, she is a um, Christ follower and in just the best way ever. And so I think because it wasn't, um, you know, I have church and I go to church and then I have my family and all of that. And when I'm at work, things are at work. And with small gestures and, you know, a small conversation here and there, you tend to know, um, you tend, you think you know the people that you're with. But I think during this time, 
because we've had so much more time together. Um, and just the struggles that all of this has brought out. I have gotten to know my friends in a much deeper way. And um, I shouldn't say I'm surprised, but maybe a little bit with how deep their faith is. And just the fact that I've been able to surround myself by such um, deeply spiritual people, which really has been a blessing to me. Um, so that probably was um, a little bit of a surprise. I think the other thing that has just surprised me beyond belief is how well my children have done with this quarantine. Um, you know, they, um, they were on spring break and came back and didn't have to go back to school. And I was like, oh my goodness, they're gonna drive me crazy. They're gonna wanna go out. I'm gonna have to be disciplining them. No, you can't go out, it's not safe. And truly, I think because everybody's in the same boat, I didn't have that problem. I actually had started getting a little worried that they were getting a little too comfortable being home, um, which is shocking. But I guess it's because nobody else has anything else to do either. So I think those are, those are the two big things. And I would say building a group of people in all of the areas of life that you tend to spend time in that can reinforce your belief system and that can actually hold you accountable and someone that you can bounce ideas and thoughts off of, I think is, I think that's been the best thing for me. Great, awesome. We have you come back and talk to us about community in a couple of weeks, but. Yeah. <laughs> all right, friends, so I will, let's open it up to all of you that have joined us. Thank you for coming to worship and joining us for this call and this conversation. I think we can uh, make it to where if you have a question, you can just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask Dana directly. I will give that a shot. And if that doesn't work, then I'll moderate. But I think we can do that. So we open up the, the floor now for you all. Dana? Yes. This may be a little tangential, but I've been so worried about pregnant women. Could you talk just a little bit about how the pandem <clears throat> pandemic has affected women and particularly women of color? That's a great question. We know that morbidity and mortality for women of color, even prior to the pandemic, um, is markedly elevated above um, women, uh, Caucasian women. We see increased risk for preeclampsia, which is a disease specifically just to pregnancy, hypertension. They can go into kidney failure. They can have lots of their pregnancies and stroke and die. Um, we see markedly elevated rates of just baseline hypertension and diabetes. Um, so all of those things um, had not changed, but because of access to care, which has been hindered somewhat during um, the pandemic, um, has made it a little bit harder. So our office um, changed uh, plate and we stopped caring. I shouldn't say stopped caring, but we basically put a halt to all non-urgent GYN patients and we're just strictly seeing our OB patients. So they would be able to come in and get seen. Women of color, um, we know die at three to four times higher rate pregnant women, um, primarily from preeclampsia, which is the hypertensive disease, um, longstanding or new onset hypertension, and from hemorrhage. So hemorrhage is still one of the largest issues. Um, I know you guys remember maybe hearing about uh, Serena during her pregnancy, and she had already had a prior history of pulmonary emboli in her lungs um, prior to getting pregnant with some of her surgeries for her sports. And then when she was pregnant, she actually basically had made a self-diagnosis and had trouble getting the healthcare professionals who were even caring for her to pay attention. So women of color, I think part of it is access to care. Part of it is actually getting someone to pay attention to their symptoms. And the third part is really, um, you know, education. We have, um, we have a huge problem with educating people about pretty much anything, but especially their own health. 
because I think sometimes they think if someone knows about something, if they have the knowledge and they have the wisdom, then they're naturally going to be a better advocate for themselves. And sometimes it's easier to keep people in the dark. It's less bothersome, right? If somebody knows how to um, invest their money in the stock market, one, they you know, may challenge someone who's in that position and being paid. So it's not so much we don't want patients to be educated. We want them to be educated. And I think um, minority groups have often lived with less transparency, less access, and in turn that's created, um, it's a very complex dynamic, but it's created um, a vocal mistrust for the health community. What I'm experiencing now in Denver is um, there are not many African-American OBGYNs. I mean, I think I can name, you know, I, I know three or four in the Kaiser system, but as far as private OBGYNs, there's about three of us, Aurora, Denver, and out south. Um, and that's who take care of just general OBGYN. So my schedule is just jam packed. I mean, I'm booked out until November, which is crazy. I don't like being that busy because it doesn't make it flexible for patients to get in. And what I'm hearing from my African American patients is a growing distrust of the healthcare system, which then makes it harder on me because I can't be there 24 seven. And so I have to, you know, really counsel them and tell them, my partners, the, the other people that are here to help care for you, will care for you. They love you. And I do believe that the majority of healthcare providers that I know, no matter what color, ethnic background, political background, you know, um, they're really wonderful people. We take an oath to do no harm and to treat anyone who walks in the door and to treat them with respect. Now you can find that on different levels, but I think as a whole, um, that's what I've always experienced and that's what I see. But sometimes convincing our greater community of that when they hear the statistics on the television or they have a personal friend who's experienced something that they thought was wrong, convincing them is, is you know, difficult. So we're, we're actually, you know, I have those conversations with my patients. Um, in general, in trying to educate them, all of them, and then specifically my patients of color, I do my best to really try to bring their, their level of anxiety down. This is what we do. This is what you should look for. You know, this is what you should let me know about. We're here for you. So I think that helps. Thank you. Yes, and I'll also say one other thing that's been interesting about videos is, um, you know, we get welcomed into someone's home, into their space. You know, when they come into the doctor's office, into our space, we get to, you know, they see what we see, which is, you know, a very medical oriented space, but it's so nice. Um, some of my patients are incredibly artistic. Like Gaia, I'm looking at your, your uh, blanket on the back of your couch. It's amazing. And then I get to see all the art and Susan's art hanging and the flowers. And so it kind of gives us a new uh, view and perspective into that patient, which has been really cool. Great. Are there other questions for Dana? Yeah, Ruthann. Hi, Dana. Hi, Ruthann. I've been wondering and I've been concerned about the increased incidence of COVID among people of color. Have you got any ideas what we as a church, a mission committee could do to help provide or advocate for health care for people of color? That's a great question. I think um, number one, it's education. I think the biggest um, issues are, I think, I think, you know, specifically with COVID, it's just got to be plain and simple um, messaging and information. And that's for everyone across the board, a consistent message of, you know, we could actually get control of this virus if everybody 
did what they were supposed to. I think that's why our numbers in Colorado have been markedly better, not just because we have a healthier state in general, but because you know our mayor and our governor really took it serious at the very beginning. I think now I see people walking around a little lax and I think as healthcare professionals, we're, we're okay if you're out taking a walk and you have your mask with you and there's nobody around and you pull it down. I don't think anyone's gonna argue with that, but when you get around people, pull your mask up. I think if we could do that, it would, be, it would just make a huge difference. Testing, I know there are new CDC guidelines that just came out. Um, I and some of my frontline workers, we still believe that, you know, if you're, if you're wondering, if you're concerned, and definitely if you have symptoms, you should be tested. We do have the capability now of doing the SARS-CoV-19 IgG and IgM for antibody testing. Um, the sensitivity now is in the 90 percentile for some of the tests. The NAAT testing is quite sensitive. And that's the one that most of them are recommending that you get now. So National Jewish, the University of Colorado, and SCL, our healthcare system, we have that testing available. So those are the big things. Um, when, when this first came out, because we weren't getting a lot of guidance nationally, um, physicians were very, very um, in tune with what goes on. Facebook, good or bad, has provided an outlet and a way for us to communicate. So in the very beginning in February, when this was primarily in Washington state, I was on a bunch of um, OBGYN COVID sites and then just general sites. We would get downloaded information, how they were taking care of patients in ICUs, what they were doing, what was working, what was not working, because the data just wasn't there at that point. We were tag teamed into, um, video conferencing, some of them that were interacting with China, how they were caring for patients. And so there, we were just like in a, in a situation like this, we were just kind of in the background listening to some of the um, conferences that they were talking about, what they were doing and what was working and what was not working. And um, that was amazing because our ICUs, because we didn't have protocols, a lot of it was going on. This is what they're doing in Washington State. It's not working. This is what we're going to do here until we started getting more and more information. So I think just the dissemination of accurate, truthful, scientific information to all communities and, you know, challenging people who don't believe this. You know, I can't believe with 180,000 deaths in the United States that someone has not known someone who has either gotten COVID or known someone who's passed away. I had one family member at Rose in the ICU for 62 days, was able to come off the vent and went into a rehab. Another family friend who was on the ventilator at Rose for 40 days and came off the vent and went home, both African-American. And they did well because they had really great care and because our hospitals were not overcrowded. I think what they're experiencing in the South um, is um, beyond scary. Um, you know, we were extremely worried that we weren't gonna have enough PPE. Even now when I go into the OR to do surgery, I have to check out a mask. And that mask I have to wear for five times, which is ridiculous. Um, in between use, I have to send it down to get UV sterilized. So when that mask comes back to me, it smells incredibly bad. It's horrible, but we're still in a PPE shortage. Um, that's what I have to do five times. So, you know, we need to educate if people knew what their physicians are having to do what their surgeons are having to do to care for them. We've changed our OR protocols. So when we have a patient, any patient, they have to get tested unless it's a non-emergent case. They're tested for COVID, they're supposed to quarantine. When we bring them into the operating room, um, we have a six minute delay of only anesthesia and um, anyone else who's wearing a protective 
PPE, like an N95, if you're wearing a regular mask or shield, you can't go in during any aerolizing procedures. And then the team comes in to take care of the patient. Um, we have different smoke evacuators to grab the air that's in the operating room and evacuate that. We have um, different protocols now. So all of this is added time. You know, we have about 20 to 25 minutes additional time onto every surgical procedure now. Um, so that's different. Patients wonder why things take so long now. So I think just really education and really being your brother's keeper. Like, hey, you know, maybe you shouldn't go to that party. You know, maybe you should avoid that for now. And I think what our church has done by having um, video service is just amazing. I'm disappointed we're not back in, you know, the building and in church to fellowship with each other. But I'm very respectful that I think it's what's best until, you know, things get better. Look at our community. We've done pretty well. So, yeah, my sister-in-law um, had COVID. She's not real sure how she got it. And she was tested and quarantined, was tested again and still positive. And today she sent me a text. She got her test results from a couple of days ago. She's finally negative. So after 62 days in quarantine, she can finally come out of her house. 62 days. So, That's yeah. a lot. Woo. That's a long time. That's a long here, time. And here we get, we get irritable about not being able to, you know, go for a walk or go to the movies. Um, Absolutely. I, I have a question. Sure. What about people that don't have technology? How are they dealing with, how are we having to deal with these people? don't have computers or iPhones or even cars in some cases? So that's a great question. I have um, someone who needs to have surgery and she has to come in for her pre-testing and she doesn't have a car and most of the places are drive up. They don't want you out of your car. Um, so we have to make special um, circumstances. So the, um, the people coming out to test is a little different. That is a challenge though. I mean, technology has been really hard, especially for our older patients who don't have the ability to Skype or FaceTime. The majority of them have someone in their family though, who has been willing to assist. Um, we do a lot of telephone visits because a lot of patients are even scared still to come into the office because they're like, well, doctor's offices are for sick people. I'm not sick, I don't wanna to come to your office and get sick, but I need a refill on your, my medication. So we've been doing a lot of our visits um, on the telephone for patients who don't have video capability. And I will say the primary care offices are getting busy again. Um, something that's, you know, we're talking about in the medical community right now is uh, the risk for, for influenza and COVID at the same time now. So, you know, fall's coming into um, play. This is our influenza season is starting. We're encouraging everyone to get their flu vaccines. There's a super vaccine for senior citizens. Um, some of us believe that it, the influenza season may not be as bad this year. And the biggest reason is because people are wearing a mask. So we're not gonna be seeing that spread of germs and the increase for influenza now. If, communities are lacking in doing that, then we probably will see co-infection and increased hospitalization. And that is very worrisome for us right now. Um, Dana, this is Chris. What would you say right now about um, routine but maybe for some people more important regular examinations would you advise holding off or doing those like i just got a call from my dermatologist for the yearly you know overall skin check mm -hmm. and i decided you know i think that one can wait i think I'll, I'll wait before i go in that's a very you know close contact kind of situation yeah. but i don't know do you have any general advice on that I would say in general right now, especially in our state where our rates are at least lower right now, 
I do think it's um, a safer time period to go in right now and get your annual exams. So if you're needing your medications, you're needing um, a colonoscopy because you've been putting it off for a while. Um, and definitely if you had to, um, you know, postpone or cancel back in the springtime when all of this was extremely active and we didn't have these procedures in place at the hospitals. Um, I think now is kind of an optimal time. We're kind of in this bubble right now where it's, it's probably as safe it's gonna, as it's gonna get until we get a vaccine that we know is reliable and effective. So I think right now is actually a good time. And I think most providers are really doing their best to keep their patients safe and them, their staff and themselves safe. So I think right now, if you can get in, it's a perfect time to go. Maybe in November, December, <laughs> I might move it to now <laughs> because that's gonna be you know, the height of our flu season. So that might be a time you might wanna wait. Great. Are there any other uh, questions for Dana? All right, I'm scrolling between our screens, making sure that if anybody's trying to get a word in, that I'm not missing you. All righty, I don't see anybody raising a hand or trying to get in. Um, I did want to share, I put over in the chat box um, a website for the Center for African American Health, which is a local nonprofit uh, that um, obviously deals with and does lots of education and lot, doing lots of webinars uh, specifically aimed towards African Americans and community of colors. I'm a board member. Riley Daniel was the one that recruited me onto that board. Um, and so that's a local group here doing lots of good work. So check that out. CAAHealth.org uh, is a great resource. I think, uh, Dana, what you said, simply even just, you know, encouraging one another, holding each other accountable. I love your example of, do you really want to go to that party? Do you really need to be doing that? Um, that, you know, being willing for us to do that with and for one another. Um, I've been part of those conversations where I know some of you have um, challenged parents and children and others, like, do you really need to go to that store, that again? Um, and so that, I think, you know, how do we help one another when we talk about community and the work that we're doing? So I'm seeing comments coming in here, just making sure you got lots of appreciation coming through Dana from folks that are on the call, just saying thank you and appreciate uh, you taking the time uh, to be with us and to share with us. I'll give one more opportunity for anyone else who might have a final question. And I'm not seeing that. So would you either give a thumbs up or clap uh, with, while you're muted to thank Dana for coming to be with us. Um, this is a Keeping the Faith Through COVID-19 series, and so we're excited to have her here with us. Next week, uh, Martha Teeter, who's on the call with us today, will be joining us for this conversation. She's a licensed uh, therapist, and so we'll be talking about worry and anxiety next week in service, and then going deeper into that conversation next week after worship service. So this is a church event, so I'm going to close this in a word of prayer, and then wish you all well, that you have a great Sunday and a good week, and hopefully... We'll see you soon in some capacity. Let's be in an attitude of prayer, friends. Oh, gracious and most holy God, we give you thanks for Dana and for all of the experts that will be joining us. We thank you for her work in our community with women specifically and, and even particularly with women of color. Continue to surround her, oh God, with your protection and encouragement as she continues uh, to adapt to the changes that she's seen every day professionally and personally. May she continue to be surrounded by those great community of friends and spiritual partners that you have surrounded her with. May she lean on them and on her faith. And may we do the same, oh God. May we continue to know that you are present with us, that no matter what changes we are all going through, that you're here with us and that we have one another. We ask that you continue to be with us, oh God, as we end this call into whatever it is that we might be up to the rest of the day and into this week. We give you thanks, oh God, for loving us. We give you thanks, oh God, for the people that make up Park Hill, that are our community, that are beyond even who might be on this call or worshiped with us. Thank you, God. It's in your son's name, Jesus, we offer this prayer together. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you, everybody. Have Thank a great you. day, everyone. Thank you all. Bye.